Hello guys, David Vokes here. Well, it's another beautiful day here in Oklahoma. Sun is shining. It rained a little bit last night. Wind came up and shook the trees a little bit, an hour or two, and rained some. And then it all just kind of passed by, and now it's warm and sunny again. There's still some dust in the air. And I think that's why it's so warm. It turned off real hot last week, and I think it's because... They claim there's a dust storm that got, the dust got up in the atmosphere from the Sahara Desert. And it's flying around the sky and it's covering the whole earth. It's blanketing the world with this dust. And I remember hearing about that dust in the Sahara going up into the sky some years ago. And I hadn't heard of it since. But they're claiming that this time is one of the worst times recorded. It's kind of like back in, um, most of you probably don't remember, but when Mount St. Helens went off, the ash from that volcano went up into the sky and covered the earth. And the area near Washington and Idaho and certain areas over there, we had half an inch in Idaho of ash that fell on the ground. So that's a lot of ash that far away, several hundred miles away. And then over there in Washington where it actually happened, they had several inches of this ash. Well, it went up into the atmosphere and went around the world. And I remember, no one else mentioned it, but I used to think when I was a young man, I remember that year we didn't have any winter in Idaho. There was no snow that year was the only time I'd never, I had ever heard of, you know, or ever seen no snow in Idaho. But I thought, well, it'll just be one year. The next year, we had almost no snow. It, it only snowed for, I guess, seemed like very, like maybe a couple of weeks or something. I mean, normally you get snow all year, all winter, from... Oh, late September, October, all the way in through till the spring. It's always cold. Sometimes it gets 30 below, you know, but not that year and the year after. And I remember thinking every year after that, wow, this has really changed everything because there really was global warming, it, it, it felt like. But, you know, as the years went on, it got more and more normal. And they started getting snow in Idaho again. Uh, I mean, maybe it took two or three years. I don't remember. But but I remember thinking that even five years later, it still was less snow than it used to be. Even though we got snow again all winter long, it was less snow and it wasn't as cold. So I've been saying that for a long time. But then I thought, well, if that's the case, I don't understand why... There have been a lot of other volcanoes that have gone off. But I haven't noticed those doing anything the way St. Helens did. So I don't know if it was because of Mount St. Helens that the world got warmer with all the ash in the air. Because it seems like that would have settled within a year or so or a few months. I don't know. Things would have went back to normal. but And they did a little bit. But... Then they, there was some talk about oh, the ice polar caps were melting. And, and somebody else said, no, actually, it's getting colder in Siberia. That the magnetic north is changing. It used to be up just above Ontario, you know, uh, basically right off the coast of Alaska. And now it's changed and it's gone several hundred miles over into Siberia. So what's actually happening is, is that Alaska is warmer and North America is warmer. But that Russia is actually colder than it used to be. So all this melting of the ice that they're talking about was the melting on the one side. There's actually more buildup of ice in other areas. And that really hadn't changed at all. Well, I don't know. 
because I do remember there were a few winters where uh, Britain and Russia and all of that area where they were saying, oh, we're way colder than it used to be. I don't know. But at the same time, it was warmer over here. That's possible. I'm not even sure, and I don't know that anybody is, uh, what this magnetic north is. But I think it has to do with the a magnetic wobble. So, though there is still a, a central north pole that hasn't really changed. There's some sort of a, a magnetic wobble that is getting wider and wider, almost as if you've got a top that's spinning and that top is slowing down. And when it's spinning really fast, it's the outer edge of the wobble is closer to the center. It's spinning real fast and it's not wobbling. But as it slows down, it begins to wobble and then boom, it falls over. So some have said that this thing, what's going on is that that not the earth itself because we're still going the same speed so that's why it's a little curious but that somehow there is this magnetic wobble there's some kind of other um, torus field that's spinning and getting kind of a wobble and making a uh, a, a magnetic pull or an opening in the magnetic sphere. And it's changing the way that mag the, the compasses work and stuff. I don't know if it's, if anybody really knows exactly what's going on. But, you know, there, there are a lot of various reasons why people believe that that could be going on. I don't know. But I'm now thinking about this Sahara Desert thing and wondering why we're having more dust this year because that would seem to indicate that there would be some uh, some other uh, measure that maybe we're getting much warmer as a globe because if we didn't have all this dust in the air from Sahara in years past if this is the biggest that they've recorded and I'm not even sure about that I heard somebody say that so I'm not completely sure this is the biggest they recorded, but at least it's a big one. Then that might mean that because the earth is warming up, it would be drying out, and perhaps the Sahara is gaining ground and getting drier. Well, Africa, of course, is in the southern hemisphere, and it's on the opposite side of the world. So that would be interesting, because I've heard about Australia for several years, getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Well, if we're getting warmer in the United States, then it would, and, and, and yet in the Northern Hemisphere, on the opposite side, it's getting colder. If that's true, and there is indication of that, then that would make sense that on the opposite side of the globe, from the United States, such as Australia and Africa, they would be getting warmer but at the southern end, so they're the opposite in the sense that we're in the north, they're in the south, but also opposites in the sense that we're on one side like the west and they're in the east. That would mean that it might be getting colder in uh, Brazil, Argentina. I don't know. I have, I would have to look that up. If that's the case, then there's a lot of this weird things going on that not that the scientists aren't taking into factoring in. Now I don't know if they're doing it on purpose or they just don't know. And I don't know. I'm just throwing these things out there. Because it doesn't, to me, seem like the world is changing in any way. We still have winter and summer and fall and everything seems to be on schedule. And there are definitely short-term cycles and so forth. But 
Who knows? I know, boring. I really don't... Uh, I don't really know what to say today because I didn't think I did a video yesterday. Um, in the last few days, I really didn't... I don't know what to think. Um, I get on and... YouTube tells me about two or three months ago, maybe it was four or five months ago, I don't remember, time goes by so quickly, but they said, we're taking a video down, we're taking it down, violating our terms of, of service. And I didn't like that at all, because I knew that meant they were using that as an excuse, because it, there was nothing hateful that's what they claimed, that I violated hate speech. Well, there was nothing hateful in that video. It was just my usual rants and, and, and you know, exposing the elite and, and whatever. Now, I don't believe there was anything in that video that could be said with hate speech in any way, shape, or form. <coughs> but they took it down and they said they were going to give me a warning and they gave me a little red circle on my my YouTube um, account. And they said, that was just a warning. And it will stay on my record. And they said, now if you get three more taken down, we're going to take down your channel. If you get two, it might penalize you in some way. Or if you get one, you might not have anything. But if you get two or three, we might penalize you. And if you get three within three month period, we're going to take your channel down. Some kind of penalty, at least. I think they said take my, my channel down. It mo possibly could, could result in that. And so, I was worried about that. I didn't like that at all. I even appealed it. And they said no. Well, in the last month, they've taken down, uh, let's see, I think four more. So this was like a couple of weeks ago I took the first one down. And I thought, oh, and there was absolutely no reason to take it down. It's just propaganda. It's just, it's just, uh, it's just a hoax. They're just finding some reason to take these down because they didn't like the content. And it seemed, I just kind of felt like they were about ready to say, oh, you, you, we got three of them in the last two weeks and they were going to do them. And say, I've, I've seen them do that. They'll do it. And you'll think, oh, well, that's just, I hadn't had that in months, you know, I'd never had that happen. So this is just one of those things that happens and it won't happen again right away, probably. I'll be fine. But then, boom, two days later, they got another one and two days later. So it's all orchestrated. They want to get three of them in a row so they can get you out of there. And that's what I thought they would be doing. So that's why I told you guys the other day, I got rid of hundreds of my videos about four or five days ago. I just got rid of hundreds of them. Anything that I thought would be iffy that they might not like or anything. Basically kind of like political ones, just get rid of them. And I thought if I do do a video, if I do do, <laughs> I don't care if you do do, da do da do da do da do. That's an old song that Johnny, Johnny Cash sang. Uh, <laughs> I'll never forget that. There's some strange song a lot of people probably haven't heard. It's a guy crazy song the guy gets bopped in the head of the newspaper the newspaper or something and and uh then Johnny Cash goes I don't care but you die you die you die you die <laughs> uh, I don't know why I remembered that song so they had told me they were going to take me out if they took three down well they've taken four in the last month two or three weeks and every time they said no penalty, we're just taking it down. It's kind of weird, kind of a new thing. They're just kind of saying stuff like, we know that you're disappointed. You're probably disappointed. They use that expression. Um, there will be not be any penalties or copyright strikes at this time. Okay. So it seems to me then that what they're saying is, is that, look, we know that this is bogus. We're not going to take your channel down. We, you haven't done anything wrong. But we're just getting rid of the the videos that we don't like. That's the way I look at it. It's censorship. 
but it still worries me. And so I'm just nervous because um, they've bankrupted me three times already. Um, I literally had to file for bankruptcy last year. And I don't want to lose this place here. Um, well, I don't want to stop, especially at this point. I mean, this everything is in is in limbo. Like three months ago, they told us to all go into our house and and we couldn't come out. Basically, all the restaurants shut down, and I hated it. And it was it was it's nerve wracking. It's we we nobody knows what's going on. And people are having a real hard time with this. And you're trying to figure out what's really going on. You think, well, in a couple months we'll go back to work. Possibly it'll be all over again. We'll act like it never happened. Well, it's becoming more and more apparent that they have no intentions of going back to work. No intentions. Uh, this is absolutely a plan that they have. And so now everything is suspect. This Sahara Desert dust storm. If they really are planning something, which it's become very obvious that they are, what would stop them from putting something in the dust? The only thing I can think of is, is that they are not allowed, that our Father in Heaven is watching over us, and they've got a certain period of time. We... we that's I know it sounds crazy, but it does appear that there's an age that they have a, a certain age that they have to work. And at the end of the age, it's like there's a transfer of power. Now, that's kind of crazy. Um, you could understand why there'd be a transfer if it was like, oh, well, the sun comes up at six in the morning, so... You know, the moon transfers his power over to the sun. Okay, that's something that's mechanical. That's why it happens at 6 o'clock in the morning, because there's cycles. The only cycle that I can see when you're talking about astrology is this, the cycle of the heavens, the stars, and the influences that the stars have on us. So there could be some very dark negative in influences from certain planets, and planetary alignments. And in the long run, as we've said, each of these astrological ages is 2,100 years. So it almost seems as if, as if when you get down to the last 40 years, the last generation, there's this period of time. And maybe there's some overlap between ages. But it seems as if... Uh, uh, well, there's another reason why it could be. We talked about the other day how if Jesus got went up into the sky and was caught up into the clouds and their eye and they couldn't see him and they kept staring into the heavens, and these two men stood in white apparel, appeared suddenly. The Bible says they just suddenly appeared. Two men, you know, reminiscent of the two men that appeared to Abraham that ate and drank a meal with him. There was actually three. One of them said his name was Yahweh. And the other two angels, they went to Lot. And, and But Yahweh continued standing before Abraham. And they were having a meal and they washed their feet and everything. So, And then, of course, when they went to Lot's house, the people of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to have... Uh, Sexual relations with these angels. So they were people. They were beings. Physical beings. Not gods. Well, Jesus said, ye are gods, and the scripture cannot be broken. So what is a god? Well, a god is a, appears to be a human being. <laughs> and these two human beings that suddenly appear when Jesus is sort of teleporting into the air, going up into the clouds and taken away from their sight. And they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? You fools. <laughs> Basically, it's like they're saying, are you, what are, you, what are you silly? You don't understand what's going on here? He shall come in like manner that you've seen him go. 
Hmm. So, because I've always kind of made fun of this thing. Like, people talk about the resurrection, and they're like, oh, they're going to come back up out of their graves. And so, uh, it kind of puts a picture in your mind of, like, the dawn of the dead, you know. So, people are going to be coming out of the grave. All right. Well, they're buried under the ground. Their bodies rot, rotted away. There's nothing but bones left, if that. So, the sinew and all the flesh would have to come back to the bones. But now... When that happens, they're under the ground, so they got to dig their way out of the ground, like the dawn of the dead, right? Uh, that doesn't seem likely to me. It just doesn't seem likely that that's what the resurrection means. And of course, that's not what it means, as we've discussed. The resurrection is to do with, there's two different kinds of resurrection, and the first resurrection is a spiritual awakening. And anybody who has part in the first resurrection, the second death, has no more authority. And as I've explained, the first death was spiritual. The second death is physical. So if you have a spiritual resurrection, then the second death or the physical death doesn't happen anymore. So so the two resurrections that Jesus talks about is the resurrection to eternal life and the resurrection unto judgment. The, resu the resurrection unto eternal life would be an awakening, a spiritual awakening. The resurrection unto judgment would be like reincarnation, a coming back again to this world, a standing up again, a resurrection to pay for judgment, to pay for the things like karma. So that then is talking about reincarnation, the second, the second resurrection. So when the Apostle Paul says that he was going to do anything he could and everything he could to attain unto the first resurrection, what he was saying is, is he wanted to attain while he was in this life the awakening, the conscious awakening, the Christ consciousness, the spiritual resurrection, so that he would never physically die again. And so you have these expressions in the Bible, you know, like rapture and all these things, and people don't know what they mean. And so you have to ask then, what is it? mean when it says Jesus will return? Well, we've talked about this aspect of it, that the word in Greek for coming, the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, it's always talking about his coming. That is the Greek word parousia. And in Greek, that does mean presence. It doesn't mean coming. So really, it should be translated, when will be your presence? When will you be present with us? And one, and that certainly come, calls to mind another more or less spiritual understanding of this. Not coming down out of the sky, right? Which would be kind of silly. Kind of like the clawing your way up out of the grave, right? That's kind of silly. It doesn't sound like that would be the correct meaning. And I don't believe it is. And I'm absolutely certain that's not what that means. So I had thought, well, then it probably Jesus is not going to actually come. But he's talking about being present. And he's talking about, I stand at the door and I knock. And anyone will open, I shall have, I shall come in unto him and have supper. Which means in, in those ancient days, they meant have a communal meal. So it's more like saying communion. When that happened with the disciples, they ate the bread and their hearts began to burn or their center, the, down in their heart, it began to burn and it said their eye became open, their eyes, and they recognized him. So I have said that that means the recognition of the Christ within us who's sleeping in the boat. It is the, the revelation. Who do you say I am, Peter? Well, you're the son of the living God. When you receive that recognition of who you are, then that's the second coming, the parousia. Because he, he comes in his saints. We're the temple of the living God. However, when you look at that verse, specifically, where Jesus is teleporting into the air, obviously, because they're standing there looking up into the air. And um, the, the, the Greek says, Standing there, gazing into heaven. 
he will come in like manner as you see him go. Now that doesn't sound like just his ghostly presence within us. It sounds like some literal coming. And but although there's other verses that say that the kingdom of God doth not come with observation. They will not say lo here or lo there. Why the kingdom of God is within you. So you see there's lots of verses that would indicate that it is within you. This same thing is happening with just a, lot, a whole lot of things. Because it's also the same kind of thing you find with uh, a lot of people today who think that Jesus never existed. Because after all, if Jesus was the Christ, this uh, the spiritual inner man, we're all in Christ from the founding of the world, the spiritual recognition of the inner spiritual powerful man within you, then this is just a parable. Jesus never came to the earth. He never walked the earth. But you see, I know that's not true because as we've said, the Bible has many layers. But if you, but the rule has to be that if it, the Bible can't be taken literally in some places, like if, if something is false on its face, then you have to take it all false. You can't, you couldn't believe if the, if, yeah, if the Bible was a parable, it was just a story and it says, this is just a parable, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. Book of Revelation is a parable, symbols. But when you're talking about history, it said, in the year of Augustus Caesar, you know, it's talking about, uh, you know, Luke says, I have endeavored to figure out all of the history and I've laid it out before you. And then Peter did this, and then Paul did that. And then, no, this is history. And this is literal. You can't just throw all that out. Because if you did, you'd have to say it's, it's a lie. And if it's a lie, then you can't believe the spiritual part of it either. And there's some very critical verses. The Apostle John says this is what the Antichrist would teach. That he did not walk in the flesh. He did not come in the flesh. That's the teaching of Antichrist. So according to the Apostle John, Jesus came in the flesh. And it says that many times. I mean, in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word with God. And the Word became flesh and resided among us. Now, again, in that verse, you could say, well, he's talking about resided in our flesh as a Christ being. Yeah, that's not what it's saying. It's saying he was a person with the Father. He was God. And then he became flesh. And we beheld his glory as that of the only begotten of the Father. And then more, more literal verses where the Apostle Paul says that he is the firstborn among many brethren. Now, unless you believe that you are not a real person, then you can't believe that Jesus was not a real person because he's your brother. And it says he partook of flesh and blood as did his brethren. That's a quote from the Apostle Paul. So we've got John saying the Antichrist message is that Jesus uh, would be a ghost. He wouldn't he that he didn't he never really walked the earth. There's no real story here. There's nothing literal to the Bible. That's the Antichrist message. We've got Paul confirming that over and over again and Jesus himself. And now we've got two angels that suddenly appear as they all stand gazing into the heavens. And they testify that Jesus shall return from the sky, teleporting down from the sky. And to get very specific, they say, every eye will see him. This is another place where the Apostle Paul says that not only his coming is going to be literal, but that every eye will see him. Now, again, we may be talking about the spiritual eye or a spiritual awakening, but it's going to be an event. And it's going to come at the last age. So, as I said the other day, I believe, wow, there is going to be a, a spiritual awakening. And that is the parousia, or the coming of the Lord, primarily. I do believe that Jesus himself was a, hum, was a human being. And that he's God. He is the, the heir, right? The firstborn son of his father. And when Jesus said, I do only what I see my father doing, then I think that 
if we're going to use the scriptures the way we're doing it, using every verse and, and being very clear about the meaning of each verse and having rules of interpretation here, then I think the rules of the interpretation as the apostles gave us, saying, yes, you must take it literal, but it also has spiritual application. Taking those rules, I don't see how you can get around the fact that Jesus literally existed, that he flew off into the sky and was taken up into the clouds, meaning there was a ship waiting for him. And so this is what we were talking about. I got off into this because I was saying, how do we know, you know, what what day or what event or what happens? Is there a, a specific moment in time? Why does it have to be? Why is it if this devil is so bad and he's ruling the world, the beast and the false prophet and all that stuff, why doesn't God take them out now? Well, it's not their time. Remember, we also talked about the guy who had legion of demons and Jesus walked over there and, and they're like, oh, we know who you are. Have you come to torture us before our time? So there's a specific time. Remember when Jesus said, it's not my time. They asked him if he would like to go down to the festival, the winter festival of dedication. And Jesus said, it's not my time, because that's in the winter. And the sun, Jesus being the sunlight, it's not time for the sun to shine. It's still winter. you got to wait till spring. So, the marking of the time is the marking of the age, an astrological age that begins at March 21st, which is the spring equinox, which doesn't just mark the, the spring. It actually marks 6 o'clock in the morning when the sun comes up on the calendar or on the clock. Because this 360 degree wheel is used for time and for months. So hours and months, 12 months, 12 hours, and also 12 ages, aeons. And so <sighs> Satan's reign, he has his time. And... It, it appears that our Father in Heaven allots him a specific time. Jesus cannot come back until his time. So now we've, we've, we've sort of defined what, in, in some way, what that time is. It has to do with this age, a cycle of time that can't be sped up or slowed down it's just like you can't change the time when the sun's going to rise you can't change like the sun can't say oh i'm i'm so much better than the the moon uh everybody's waiting for me um without me the the grass can't grow and the flowers can't bloom why well, i'm just going to start early we'll get rid of that rascally darkness just throw him away and i'll just come up early can't do it You've got to go through the darkness. In fact, the darkness is necessary. The negative energy is necessary for the growth of the plants. There's a time to sleep and there's a time to be awake. There's a time to run. There's a time to walk. There's a time to pray. There's a time to, you know, to sing. There's a time for everything under the sun. And you see, we were under the law, the dispensation of the law for a period of time. As heirs to the kingdom, but yet and joint heirs with Christ and heirs of God, but yet still as children under the steward until the time arrives. When we grow up, we, there's a certain day, a certain age. You got to be, you become 13, you're a man, you know. Um, and if you're 20 years old, you, you could be a priest. You had to be uh, 30 to be uh, certain kinds of priests and an elder had to be 50, some people say, uh, it appears, in some cases at least. So there seems to be uh, measurement to this and definitive cycles that the gods seem to, to go by. Now I was going to say that maybe there are reasons other than just astrology, because if the heavens move in cycles and you can't change that, are we then talking about the negative forces of these physical planets 
and their energies? Or are we talking about entities? If Jesus is the Son, is he really the Son? Well, it says in the Bible, God is light. Oh, now you're talking about uh, worshiping the sun, Dave. The Bible says that's wrong. We don't worship the sun and the moon and the stars. That's paganism. That's wrong. That's evil. Well, but what people don't understand is there, there are all these different meanings. And no, we wouldn't get down on our knees and worship an image. We wouldn't worship the earth even though there's consciousness in the earth. Um, if I was, uh, let's say, a human being and I was uh, a king, well, in times past, people worshipped kings. They bowed to them. They curtsied. They, your honor, and they, you know, uh, oh, your majesty, and you know that kind of thing. But that's sacrilegious. Jesus said we don't do that. So even though there's a man who's intelligent and Maybe that man would be even powerful, like an angel. But the angel said, don't bow before me. Don't do that. I'm your only your fellow servant. So we wouldn't even bow to a man, even though he's an intelligent. And, and for the Jesus, we're all gods. We're all the children of God, the sons of God. And we're all, ye are gods, and the scripture cannot be broken. But we don't worship each other. We worship our Father in heaven. So, just because the Son could literally be Jesus in some way, in other words, the, the manifesting effect of his mind, it's the Son that makes everything grow. What makes things grow? Well, it's heat, Dave. It's energy. We don't know. Well, where does energy come from? The source of all. The Word who was with God from the beginning. And, you know, gives life to everything. He offered that woman the, the river of life. He said, I am the truth and I am the life. So there's life in, in plants. There's life in rocks. There's life in everything, trees. And, but where does the source of that life come from? The source of the energy comes from the light in the center. So... There's these chakra points, and we have energy points. And the head is the, the crown chakra. And when that is lit up, like Buddha was born from the lotus flower, which is upon his head, and began to bloom. Well, in other symbols in our Bible, in the book of Acts, it says there was a flame that was in twain, or the twin flame, that appeared upon their head when they receive the Holy Spirit. It's symbolic of these energies that were lit. And then there's these seven candles, which represent those seven chakra points. So these energies, as above, so below, also can be seen throughout the universe, the macrocosm, the microcosm. In the human, which is the image of the divine, just a small little reflection of the divine, in the greater, we've got several um, types of the grander universe, which is the divine being. We're a type, but the whole solar system is a type because it, there's the seven planets. The sun is the brightest, and it goes all the way down to Uranus, and this is the same... Um, uh, organized uh, organization or lineup of the chart that you have in the elemental chart with uranium being at the bottom, Uranus at the bottom. And at the top, you have the halo, which is always the sun that's around uh, in the paintings. You got their head. And on their head, they had a halo. And the halo was the sort of a corona or the sun. And so in the, the Greek language, you've got helios, or helium, or the highest, or the halo, or the hello, the salute, the soul, the salutations. So the lighter 
is on top, the heavier on the bottom. So gold and lead and all those things and irons down at the bottom. But the furthest thing down there is the uranium or maybe plutonium, right? Pluto is beyond Uranus, Uranus, Uranus or whatever we call it. <laughs> so you see you have that in, in the, in, so there may be more planets than what uh, the ancient ones mention. Although Pluto is not really a planet, they say, and stuff like that. But the point is, they had seven planets, which was basically the sun and the moon and five planets. And that was supposed to correspond to the body and the seven chakras. So, where is your personality? Well, you have an emotional being within your heart. But the source is from above, from, from on high. The divine being dwells in the body. And communication comes from revelation from on high. So the source, the highest, is your head, the soul. Meaning sun, soul, S-O-L. The helios, the sun, the halo. And so it seems to me that if the unit, if, if, if the whole galaxy, you know, is the house in which our Father in Heaven dwells, we'll just go with the galaxy right now, then our Father, literally, if He created it, then the very light in the center of the galaxy literally is His mind. The center, or not the, well, it would be the center, because that's the center of the galaxy. And somewhere out in the middle, the hearth, or the earth, or the heart, is the middle. That's the central place for the emotions and where the physical parts of your being sort of coalesce and form a, a planet that is livable and where our consciousness on this earth resides, our outer consciousness. But we're not aware of the super conscious mind that is in the background, which is higher, the source. And that's Christ. So yes, I do believe that, that that the sun literally is the energy that keeps us all together and gives us life. But it's not the highest because that sun energy, remember light is a constant. Everything else is a product of light. So there is no time and space in the the center of light. In the center of each sun, there's sort of like a wormhole that goes right to the, the center of the galaxy. So they're all connected. And that's all connected to your brain. So this is why you can communicate with, in spirit with the angels or with God or with Christ. Because your mind can telepathically be in communication with Jesus. And that's how he's in you. Because he's in your mind. He's having communion. Your spirit bears witness with his spirit that you're his children. So I believe that the sun in this galaxy is Jesus. That's his inner powerful brain, his mind, the logos, which is in the Father, which is in the galactic light. And Uranus or Uranus is the highest or light, Anu, heaven, the highest light. Uranus is the combination of heaven and light, or Anu, meaning the highest light. And so in the New Testament where it says that God is light, God is love, God is spirit, all those things are, are, are uh, they're equal. So, to say that God is love is to say that he is light, is to say that he is love, is to say that he is spirit. They're all the same. And so, since we're all spirit, spirit doesn't, take, um, doesn't manifest in the physical, but it manifests as light. So therefore, Christ is manifest throughout the universe and in us, but his source is the light. So, he could have this light that could be shining but yet on his in his conscious mind he could have a body see 
while we're walking around consciously doing our thing, living in this world, in this body, that doesn't mean that we don't also have a very powerful being within us, that inner I am, that's us, that's truly us, and that is our light. But we're not consciously aware of, of our source, but it's the light, and it's connected to the sun light, and that's connected to the galactic father and his divine spirit. So we're all spirits, and our source is in the, our mind or in our light. But our body is going to be a ring around that light. It's going to be a physical, it's going to be an electron magnetic thing that pulls in form and shape and it's going to make the shape of our body and our conscious way of thinking. So Jesus has a conscious physical body. This is why he said, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended. Or spirit doth not have flesh and bones, as you see that I do. He has a body of flesh and bones, but it's immortal. Because he attained under the first resurrection, the spiritual resurrection. And so, anyone who has part in the first resurrection, which is a spiritual resurrection, awakening, spiritual awakening, the second death, which is physical death, has no more authority. So your body is flesh and bones, not flesh and blood. That's the only place in the Bible it uses the expression flesh and bones when Jesus was resurrected, which is how we're going to be. Because we're, he says, um, we do not know, we do not yet know, the apostle says, what we shall be, but when we see him, we shall be like him. Does that sound like just a parable to you? Think about that. There are many verses like that. For those of you uh, who think the Bible is just a parable and there was no Jesus, there's no history, that it's all just spiritual, we're all just going to fly away and we're not going to be we're not going to live in a, in a body anymore. This is the crowning creation of God. The man, the human, the exalted man is God. And the world will be glorified. And we will live in the body. And we will live in a paradise. And Jesus will have to live in the same world with us. Because we're his children. We're his brothers and sisters. We're all children of God. And he promises us that he will return. He makes a promise. I shall return. Fear not. I will become the world. This world is no part of my world because it's carnal. But there will be a world. A resurrected, spiritual awakened world. One that has its higher consciousness in the mind but manifests in a spiritual, immortal body. So, that's how we're in Christ. We're part of the elements that make up the solar system. We're one consciousness. There's many of us. And so what I think is that when the ages come and go, the cycles... It's far more than we can even grasp right now. Because what we're doing is we're looking into the sky and we're seeing these lights. And we're, we're just thinking that they're, they're inanimate objects out there. But the universe is conscious. We're looking at divine energy and power and things that we don't know and understand. And so... When the sun ray rises up, it has its time. You can't hasten it. You can't change it. It defeats the darkness every time. And even though in the winter you may not even remember a beautiful summer day, you it's been months and you're so cold and, and you just get depressed and you think, <clears throat> nothing's ever going to change. This is dark and bleak and... And I'm hungry for some watermelon and I want to go swimming and I want to have fun and run through the grass. And, and it's all this freezing cold. You got to stay in the cabin and keep the fire going. But then all of a sudden one day you open the cabin door and you peek out. And the sunlight shining down through the trees. And you see the dripping of the snow. It's melting. A few days later 
the snow is gone. And you see the little flower coming up out of the earth. It's beginning to bud. The signs of spring are everywhere. And the birds begin to come and cheep, chirp, excuse me, and, and make melodious song. And you begin to say, oh, wow, spring is here. And, uh, and there's nothing that the darkness can do about that. There's nothing the win- the old man winters he's defeated, he's over, he's gone, his day is done. But as we said, there's there's various mm, we're we're definitely living on a planet. But yet we're connected with the planet. And I believe there are spiritual there's spirits here. You know. Um There's definitely spirits that are in the trees and in, you know, there's the elemental spirits that the Apostle Paul says that, that Jesus conquered the jinns that you have to be, you know, in, in the story you get three wishes, but that's just a story. What it's saying is you are in command. The genie or the spirit has got to do what you say. Not just three wishes. You get as many wishes as you want. You're in control, and the angels obey your voice, or the the spirits, and you have you have the uh, the power over the physical earth. You have a power. You've got to gain the mastery. Have self control over your own body. It's just that simple. And so, not only then are we waiting for this cyclical approaching of summer the same the time of the year when the bridegroom goes to make a home for his bride and he's going to return again around Pentecost time they're going to have a great festival and the the first fruits will be ripe and we'll have a great harvest and we'll have a part this is all very symbolic but we're going into that time the night is far spent the day is at hand we're going not into uh, the past, not into at the bottom of the wheel, into the age of Aquarius. That's a lie. We're going into the age of Taurus because when Christ came 2,100 years ago, he began the age of Aries. We talked about Orion with his bow and he's shooting the bull. The forces of that bull has got to be tamed and conquered. We'll put a bit in its mouth. We'll plow our fields for the summer and for the summer harvest. And the church, which is the seven sisters in the Pleiades, they're riding on the shoulders of the bull. And Orion stands there and his his hand reaches all the way up to the Pleiades where in his hand in the sky is the ankh, which is the cross of life. We're reaching that point now when we're going to cross over in uh, the Sumerian tablets, it talks about Nibiru, which just means the planet of the crossing. It doesn't necessarily even mean the planet of the crossing. It means the crossing over. Yeah, it had to do with the planets and the star- stars that would come up over the horizon. And they were the bringers of the dawn. They were the bringers of spring. The harbingers of life, and the rains would come, and 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 the, uh, the, the everything would begin to grow, and there was fertility. It's a symbol of the time that we're living in. All of this darkness and evil that's going around us, whatever's happening, there may be a tumultuous change. There may be earthquakes and pestilences and famines in one place after the another. Jesus said there will be earthquakes get ready friends because we haven't seen the big earthquakes yet but there's going to be a violent overthrow of the other gods and the stars shall pass by and the bible says they translate it they shall fall well in a sense because there's a war in heaven and this big mountain thing falls on the earth i think there's going to be i think it took them literally two thousand years when jesus got in that ship and probably just took him a few days 
on that ship. But for us, it's 2,000 years. It was a specific period of time it took him to go down through the corridor into to uh, Orion's, the Stargate, right through Orion, cross the river Styx, the crossing, save the seven sisters or the seven bridesmaids, and which is the church, and get all the way back to the earth and arrive and we'll see him coming down out of the sky. There'll be a war in heaven. And the announcement, the eagle has landed, shall be an actual glorious moment. That will be a real moment this time. And that eagle will defeat the dragon. The dragon will fall like lightning, Jesus said. I saw Satan fall like lightning. He said that after he defeated them by casting out the devil and his demons. The Bible says you'll be thrown down to the earth knowing yet but a short time. Go forth to deceive the whole world. We're, we're going into that time now. And there may be some revolution and there may be some terrible troubles. But the time has come. The day and the hour and the month that's been prophesied. That was destined it says in the book of revelation and the day and the hour and the month arrived and the angels came down and untied the four angels that were bound at the river euphrates and that somehow portends this great war of this this war that the chinese or the 200 million man army comes across from the east and they'll be the armies of antichrist and there will be some, some rough times ahead, friends. But for all those who do not receive the mark of the beast and get out of Babylon, we won't share with her in her sins and we will not have to share in her plagues because we are not appointed into wrath. So now the time has come for us to have faith because when that tribulation comes, the Bible says that the dragon shall pour a river out of his mouth to drown us. But the earth will come to the wo woman's help, the church. And we'll go into the wilderness and we'll be protected. So Jesus said, when you see that great tribulation and all the things that Daniel spoke of in Revelation, Book of John, the Antichrist and the armies that are coming, and you see all of this abomination. When you, Like Jesus said to the disciples, when you catch sight of the wars and kingdom against kingdom and nation against nation, earthquakes in one place. When you catch sight of all of this, know that he is near at the doors. Lift up your heads erect and be happy and, and, and give him glory because you, your, your deliverance is near. Not one hair of your head shall be touched if you have faith. Because Jesus said that there's going to be a tribulation so bad that never happened before in the history of man and never will again. And unless those days were cut short, no flesh would be saved on this earth. But because of the chosen ones, those days will be cut short. Because of us. We don't know exactly what that means, but we know from prophecy that we'll be protected. And here's what Jesus said himself. When you catch sight of these things, flee into the mountains. It's very similar to Revelation where it says, get out of Babylon. Babylon's the world we live in today. And this beastly system, she's riding the beast. Well, Jesus said, flee, get out of her, my people. Flee into the mountains and don't look back. Friends, we're at that time. The cycle, the end of the age has arrived. All the signs are here. Jesus said, you can read the signs of the heavens when it comes to the weather, but you can't read the signs of the times. Look at the newspapers. Listen to the news, CNN and Fox News and MSNBC. The apostles say, in the latter days, critical times hard to deal with will be here. Men shall be lovers of themselves, disobedient, insolent, 
Jesus said, Father will be against son and son against father and brother against sister and 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 the enemies, your enemies will be those of your own household. And that is approaching us. But if you stand firm in your faith, we are not appointed into wrath. The church will be protected because we're going to leave this rotten world. You can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast, but we don't care because we're not going to be buying their stuff. Because we're going to go into the, into the mountains where we're going to be protected by our Father in heaven. We're going to have a choice. People who partake of the mark of the beast, they do it willingly. We're warned not to partake or else we shall receive part of her plagues. So as long as you don't partake of this system, as long as you get out the promises in the scripture will be firmly fulfilled. Not one verse of that book will, will be deviated from. All of his promises will become will, will be true. And they'll be fulfilled. As Jesus said, even the law not even one jot or a tittle could pass from that law and yet not be fulfilled. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. That's why we all have to live in this physical world and learn by the things in which we suffered because not one jot or tittle of the law shall be in any way abolished, but it will be fulfilled at the end of the age. You'll see the stars Pass away the astrological signs and the new age will come. You got to wait until it's time and then it will be fulfilled. The time shall be fulfilled. That day and the hour knoweth no man, but it will be fulfilled at, at the, the appointed time. And I, I, I believe that we're coming close now to the appointed time. We're definitely at that time when we need to... Um, Pay more closer attention as the day draws near and gather together with the saints in the mountains and help one another and love one another and prepare. Make sure we have that oil in our lamps. Make sure that we're helping people and feeding the homeless, healing the sick and preaching the gospel. Doing everything, every opportunity that we have. To serve our brothers and sisters. And help everyone to come to an accurate knowledge of the truth. Because the truth will set you free. And this means eternal life. Taking in knowledge of you, the only God. And the one you sent forth, Jesus Christ. So, friends, I'm going to go ahead and go, and I hope you guys have a really, really great day, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Have a good one.